First of all, Mr. Lynch, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. And we want to start by offering our condolences to you. We understand you just recently lost your mom. I appreciate that, Dominic, and I, I appreciate all the words of support and prayers from so many different folks that some knew my mother, some didn't. Uh, she was a good woman. Uh, she was 92 years old. She led a good life, and unfortunately, uh, life has to end somewhere. But I appreciate uh, everything from everybody. Okay. Well, let's move on now to the police matters. And before I get to Eric Garner, let's talk about the Gurley case in Brooklyn. Police officer, housing project stairwell, accidentally shoots Mr. Gurley. Gun was drawn, and we'll get to all of that. But there's a report. We know that the officer didn't report the shooting for six minutes. Six minutes. <clears throat> and in that time, it's alleged that instead of calling for medical attention or the police department, he was on the phone with the union rep, if you will, to cover his his uh, backside or his his uh, allegation of what's happened. Number one, is that true that he was on the phone with a union? I mean, on the texting a union rep? Quite frankly, we don't know where these reports are coming from because the police officers involved, the police officer involved in the shooting, have not been interviewed at the request of the district attorney, which is routine. So where these reports are coming from, I don't know. I'm reading them in the newspaper the same as you. I don't believe they're true. But what we ask here is allow the investigation to be based on the facts. And the facts aren't out yet. Okay, but with so many procedural failures in that case, why in the world is the PBA defending this officer? First off, making that assumption that there was all sorts of mistakes and, you, and there's been no investigation as of yet, well, we can't come to that conclusion yet. And some would ask, why do you defend police officers? Well, why do folks automatically blame police officers? If you read the headlines, every time there's a shooting, every time there's an incident, the police officer is wrong. Where the facts get lost in the fiction that you hear on the street. All we ever ask for, in this case or any other case, is fairness. Our role as the PBA is to make sure there's fairness in the process, and at the end of that process, we get to the truth, whatever that truth may be. So you're telling us it's not confirmed that he was texting his union rep? It, could, it couldn't be. They have not been interviewed. So where that came from, I haven't the foggiest idea. Is there a concern that defending every questionable police-related shooting that you risk not being taken seriously when there is a legitimate case? Well, if you look at it, and, and that's said and I've heard it before, but it's not actually true. Uh, we defend our police officers, that's our role. We're advocates for police officers. But what we're always doing is holding back a tidal wave of criticism on every case. So I would turn that question around and say, why do people automatically think police officers are wrong? Why do we listen to rabble-rousers and agitators on the street in every case? Most of these cases, we're called there by the communities in which we serve because there's a problem. And folks are safe because of police officers. So it's not that we jump to defend. is we're holding back a tidal wave of criticism, which 99.9% .9 of the time is wrong and unwarranted. There are, Mr. Lynch, protests, as you well know, all around the country regarding the grand jury not indicting in the Garner case. Even President George W. Bush said he was surprised. LeBron James at the basketball game last night wearing a t-shirt during uh, warm-ups at the Nets game that said, quote, I can't breathe. Doesn't that tell you that perhaps something is terribly wrong with the results that came back from the grand jury? No, what it tells me is folks are like lemons following just what they're hearing. And the question I ask is this. We had a grand jury seated, a mixed grand jury of gender and race. And they looked at every piece of evidence that was presented. 60 pieces of evidence, I believe, and 50 witnesses, and the witnesses varied in who, where they were from. And they looked at every aspect, including the medical examiner's report. And then they came to this conclusion. None of us have that information. I don't have it. You don't have it. And with respect to our past president, the president doesn't have it. But we're coming to conclusions. Why would you criticize a table of jurors who took their oath seriously, weighed all the evidence, and then came to a conclusion? And because we don't like the conclusion, we start criticizing it. But, Mr. Lynch, you know what the critics say. They say that in Staten Island, the deck was stacked. 
that the fix was in by the district attorney, and that many police officers live in Staten Island and retired police officers and their families, and that a police officer is going to get the benefit of the doubt way going to the extreme. What I find, and I've been doing this for a day or two, is that the jurors, when they take that oath, they take it seriously. Many times the cases and the result is what we're pleased with, and many times we're not, you know that, I've sat in these interviews on, on both sides. And to say Staten Island is one way as compared to another, 60% of New York City police officers live in the confines of New York City. They don't all live in Staten Island, they live in all the boroughs that are there. But nonetheless, those folks, more than anyone else, if you're related to a police officer, will look at the facts, because why? Because what we're looking for is fairness for our family members, we're looking for fairness for our uh, PBA members as well. Mr. Lynch, you referred to Officer Pantaleo as an Eagle Scout. Come on, Mr. Lynch. Well, that's a fact. And what I did is, there's been an awful lot of uh, information out there, but the information that was not out there, because the police officer is restricted from talking until he goes through this process, is what he was about. And that's a fact. He's a member of that community in which he served, a lifelong city resident of Staten Island. He was an Eagle Scout. But he isn't did he help folks. The situation? No, it's not inflaming the situation because what we're saying is here's what this police officer is about. Let's put a face on him because what's happening is we're getting condemned for every issue and every ill or every misperceived uh, notion across the country is now landing on this police officer. So let's tell a story of what he's about, where he's from, what his family is about. And everything I said was the absolute truth. I didn't embellish. That's the fact. He's the kind of guy, when he was a young person, he would take folks to camp that couldn't afford to do it. That's the kind of police officer, that's the kind of man he was. So what we're trying to do is say, this is a police officer involved in a terrible circumstance, let's put a face on him. We're not all faceless and we're not all the same. But Mr. Lynch, he was also um, accused of two cases and involving allegedly he violated the rights of minorities. As you know, and it was proven in Staten Island uh, through reports, that there's law firms there that automatically file suits against the city in any arrest that was happening. If you're an a, a, a active police officer, you're going to have lawsuits. Then you go into the city, and we've criticized this, where the city automatically settles. It's a nuisance suit. Just pay the money and they'll go away. Who ends up paying for it? The citizens of the city financially. But that police officer that's wrongfully sued and it looks like he did something wrong. Meanwhile, there's never any wrongdoing involved. It literally is, it's going to take too much to defend, let's just pay. But the allegation is that he, stri he strip searched someone in public, made them take off their clothes. As you said, an allegation of a lawsuit with an active police officer. There's lots of allegations against all of us. That's why we stand there and say, let there be an investigation that's come to a conclusion after that investigation, not before. You called Officer Pantaleo a good cop in a bad situation, but did he have to move in in this situation? He couldn't have talked to Mr. Garner to de-escalate the situation? If you take the uh, video as a whole, and I understand the grand jury saw more than one video from different angles, it didn't jump into the struggle. It started with a conversation. They did try to de-escalate it by saying, look, you're being placed under arrest for this. You've been here before. You know you'll be out by the end of the day with a desk appearance ticket. Those conversations were had to de-escalate it. They didn't uh, jump right into it. They waited for a supervisor to arrive. And then Mr. Garden unfortunately said, I'm not going. He decided that he is going to resist arrest. Well, a police officer doesn't have an option to walk away. Once we come to the decision that there's going to be arrest, you have to comply. If you feel it's unjust, there's mechanisms to complain. We can duke it out in front of the judge in court. But to resist arrest leads to tragedy, and unfortunately, that's what happened in this case. Well, we're talking about the video. At the end of the video, mocking the crowd that was there, apparently, when we see Officer Pantaleo waving at the camera. And, and I can't answer for that, quite honestly, and, and maybe that was addressed in the grand jury, I don't know. Maybe it was nervousness or otherwise. I, I actually don't know. But what I can look at is, does this deserve to go to the grand jury? Was there a crime committed? And in, in, in New York State, a chokehold, as some are saying, which I do not believe it was, is not illegal. 
But nonetheless, this was a takedown maneuver. So what we have to do is take the video and take all the circumstances involved, just not the part that proves what we want to argue. Mr. Lynch, do you see a scenario as the president of the PBA where Officer Pantaleo can keep his job or return to, to duty? I think he should. If he goes through the process, and he did, you and he, he goes through, and he goes through a review in the police department, and everyone under the sun is going to come and say they want to review. But the reality is, the facts remain what they are. The evidence is what it is, and the testimony is not going to change. If that grand jury came to this conclusion, whether we agree with it or not. That should be the conclusion. And if that conclusion is no true bill, this police officer, after the department investigation, should be allowed to go on with the job, which will be difficult because he has to live with this death uh, for his entire life. But nonetheless, if the facts lead us there, then he should be exonerated. So you believe he should be given back his gun and his badge, which we don't know. He may still have it. I, I don't know. But you think he should be given his gun well, back and well, back, let, put let, back on let the street. Me, let me ask the folks, let me ask you, Dominic, if you are wrongfully accused and then you go through a process and it's shown that exactly what Polk said didn't happen, that it really didn't happen that way, and you're exonerated, isn't that what this country's about? If you go through the investigation, you go through the decision, and it comes out that you're uh, no true bill, what would it, ban him to bogey land? This is not the cartoon. This is, we've gone through the investigation, this is America, we should be allowed to move forward. Do you see the feds going forward with a civil rights violation on this? I understand they're doing a review, and we're told that they're going to do an expedited review, and they're going to do it fairly. All we ever ask for is fairness. But I also ask this question. Why is it that it's police officers that always get that double jeopardy? Well, if we don't like the result in this grand jury or this trial, well, let's run to Washington and get them to review. And then you have a review there. Does that happen to anyone else, or is it just police officers that it happens to? I think it's unfair. All we're asking for is fairness. Why do you say police officers feel, feel like they've been thrown under the bus by Mayor de Blasio after the Garner grand jury came back? Rather than saying that we have to respect this grand jury's decision, we have to respect the fact they took their oath seriously and that they looked at all the evidence. Then what he laid on the shoulders of every New York City police officer is what he feels is decades of racism. Well, that's unfair. Because what I say is I have 31 years on the job, and not once did I ever hear in the radio car when the 911 call comes, hey, what color are they? Who do they love? Where do they live? It's never happened. We respond, and we do our job effectively. What about the lives that we've saved? We should be teaching our sons and daughters to support New York City police officers. We are the ones that keep our city safe. We literally stand between criminals and the good citizens. Since 1999, 80 police officers have lost their lives in the line of duty. Does that count for something? I believe it does, and I'll defend it. But the mayor does have a biracial son, and that's what he was addressing. And I, and I can't get in someone's head or someone's life, and that would be disrespectful to do that. But what he left out of that conversation when he had the conversation with the public afterwards is let us not forget a few short years ago, you couldn't walk down these streets in safety. You couldn't park your car. You couldn't go to services without being harassed by drug dealers. And also with that, all the lives, all the